Welcome to the next installment of the Lipid Maps podcast. And this afternoon, we're joined by Miguel Gijon, who is a scientist at Cayman Chemicals, but has spent all his career studying lipids. Uh, welcome, Miguel. Well, thank you very much, Matt. In spite of spending all your career studying lipids, you told me you don't like the term lipidomics. <laughs> so what, what's your concern with the uh, term? And yeah, I was afraid you were going to start by that, even though it's something I say very often. And I have two main problems with the term. The, the major one is that I think it's abused in meetings and in the literature, and it's used as an equivalent in many cases to simply lipid analysis, which mm. I, I think kind of misrepresents the idea of, of the term. If one is measuring like, something I have done many, many times, a panel of eicosanoids of 20 or 30 or 40 eicosanoids, I would not call that lipidomics. It's, it's a lipid analysis, an analysis of several lipids, but certainly not lipidomics. I, the way I understand it as it is stemmed out from genomics, and it started being corrupted in proteomics. So the idea of omics, in my opinion, tries to be a comprehensive account for the type of molecules. So with genomics, we are pretty close to that because we know all the genes. We know the 20 plus thousand genes of the human genome. Yes, and, and I guess as well in genomics, you know what you haven't got. Right. So you, you, know, you know the length of the genome, you know the bits that you've analyzed, the bits that are characterized and which bits are missing in between those. Right, that is yes, absolutely. lipidomics. Absolutely right. Then we went into proteomics and Yes, we also know the, the proteins, but then we all already be started getting into trouble because we knew from the abstracts that many of the standard analysis do grossly misrepresented or underrepresented integral membrane proteins, which in some mm. cases are not even soluble in aqueous buffers. Yes, so, so we are already I, missing I, some. I spent many years working on uh, membrane proteins. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I used to, at the University of Colorado. I used to work across the the hallway with an expert in membrane proteins, and she would always impress upon us that proteomics had a serious hole mm. in in that field. So now for, lipid, for lipids, it's even worse, which is why I don't like the term, even if the proper, I, I, I do accept it when you say in an untargeted data dependent mass spectrometry analysis, I, I think it's legitimate to use it. But still, uh, it's important that everybody understands that we know from the start that we also have big holes because all of those types of analysis are based on a traditional lipid extraction, like blind dye or an MTB based extraction. And we know from the start that there are lipids that are not there. Like short chain fatty acids are not there. A big part of the lysophospholipids partition between the two phases. So we know we are under representing yeah, that. Yes. And, and one of my favorite lipids, which are absolutely central to all lipid metabolism, whether in transformation into other lipids or for beta oxidation, which are CoA esters, we know those are in the aqueous phase of a lipid extraction. So we know right off the bat, we are leaving out one of the most important classes of lipids. Yes, so that's all why- are going to be completely missing. Right, so that's why I, I, I hesitate because omics to me sounds a little bit pretentious, especially in the context of lipids, because we know we are analyzing only a portion of them. Yes. And you said the coa esters, I mean, not only do they not partition into the um, organic phase, the hydrophobic phase, but I understand they're quite difficult to measure anyway. They are. The mass spectrometry is not, it's something we, we did some of at the University of Colorado as part of lipid maps. There was a really good scientist in the group of Al Merrill, whose charge it was to deal with with acyl coa esters, and they did publish a method that worked quite well, but it only works when one is following very strictly all the instructions they gave, which is honestly something that's really hard to do in, in most analytical labs on a routine basis. And, and I think that's the main reason it's not widely used across the field. And yes, they are, they are definitely difficult. The chromatography is, is 
very complicated and, and the extraction is when you're dealing with water soluble molecules then everything becomes a little bit more complicated yes so, there are an awful lot of yeah, things in there right but the reality <laughs> is i i have talked to several scientists that would love to measure those and they are hard to do Yes, and I guess they're quite transient species anyway. The whole nature of the CoA is it's a transfer molecule, I guess. It's part of the process of moving the acyl chain from one thing to another. So right. you wouldn't expect huge quantities of it in a cell. Right. Yeah, unless the cell had serious problems, which pro yeah. probably wouldn't be co compatible with its continued survival. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's... absolutely, absolutely correct, yes. And of course, that moves us on to... Um, the enzymes, the reason they're transient is they're handled by enzymes uh, all the time to move the acyl chain from one CoA into a lipid, out of the lipid, across a membrane, uh, wherever it's happening. The lipids in many cases are the metabolites and the enzymes are, well, the enzymes are the things that are going wrong to cause a disease, I guess we could say. Uh, mm -hmm. causes a buildup or an absence of lipids, but often the error is in the... Um, the error is in the enzymes. And yeah. a lot of your career you spent looking at enzymes. Yeah, I will also say that now we start to understand something we suspected many, many years ago is that it goes both ways. And I, I was very pleased to see in the Lipid Maps website, the posting by Ilya Leventhal talking about that lipid protein interaction that actually so yes, of course, the enzymes make the lipids, but the lipids also regulate the activity of, of yes. the enzyme. Yeah. So it's a, it's a two-way relationship there that we are only beginning to understand. So in your, um, in your career, you focused a lot on the enzymes. Are there any that really stand out? Are your enzymatic hall of fame? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, granted, we all have a, we all have a limited experience. There, there are tens of thousands of enzymes and there are not many that one can encounter in one career. My, my first experience was actually a very frustrating one. I, I spent my whole first year as a graduate student failing miserably at purifying and identifying the then elusive lysopath acetyltransferase that uses acetyl-CoA to esterify in the SN2 position of lysopath to make platelet activating factor, which is, was the the center of the study in the lab where I started as a, as a graduate student. And after a, a whole year and unfortunately many, many dozens of rats sacrificed for science, we had to abandon that project because it was, it was an integral membrane protein. It was really hard to, and I was somehow relieved that it took many more years. It took, uh, so I was doing that in the late 80s. It wasn't un in, until the mid-teens when that enzyme was finally identified. Actually, there's two enzymes, which was, they used to be called then LPCAT1 and LPCAT2. And of course, they were identified by using yeast genetics and molecular biology and techniques that we didn't have available at the time. So I, I knew it's not, we didn't fail because we didn't know what to do. It's because the, the field had not evolved enough. Yes, at that that, time. that's... That, that's right. always something of a relief, isn't it? I, I right. have the same. I, I had a, a project right. when I completely failed to purify and I was supposed to be crystallizing the enzyme. I couldn't purify it. And to my knowledge, 15 years later, it still hasn't been done. Yeah. For both of us, it was a genuinely difficult project. It wasn't that we were just bad at it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it shows two things that I think are important. One of them is that sometimes when I, when I talk to people that, seem to be impressed with the PhD title afterwards. It's like, that doesn't prove anything. We are not smarter than anybody, but we can take more punches. We have been down many times and gotten back up. And that's what I think we all share in common. But the other lesson that's even more important to that, and I, and I try to emphasize to young people, is if you have a project and the experiments fail, now, the, the first reaction of everybody is, I did something wrong. And that's true in many cases. And then you do it again. You think it again. You set up all the right controls. You make sure all the reagents are fine. And you do it again. But if you fail again, then probably the 
field is not ready. There is not the right techniques. You don't have the right instrumentation. And it's time to either look for a collaborator that may have the right instrumentation or just <laughs> try to do something else, which is what happened to me. And, and then I jumped that, that kind of segues into the next enzyme because when we abandoned that, then we were, for different reasons, we were interested in phospholipase A2 present in the plasma of patients that were in the emergency room with septic shock. And the activity of this enzyme in this plasma was astonishingly high. We used to measure that with very primitive methods with radioactively labeled E. coli. That one we were able to characterize as SPLA2 2A, and that, that was the focus of my PhD thesis. So that was the next enzyme in my career. Then the next one, I, as a postdoc, when I came to the United States, to the to National Jewish in Denver, with an outstanding scientist, Christina Leslie, that was a pioneer in the brand new enzyme CPLA2, cytosolic PLA2, it was called then, now we call it CPLA2 alpha or group 4A PLA2. And I spent many years studying the regulation of that enzyme, which is fascinating. It's regulated by phosphorylation, by calcium, by intracellular location. It's really a fascinating enzyme. And, and mm. it's critical in the production of eicosanoids because it has a strong preference for phospholipids with arachidone and testerified in the SN2 position. So after that, I went back to Spain for a couple of years and I continued working on, on CPLA2 and, and some of its translocation properties, regulation by other lipids, like I was mentioning, by phosphoinositide phosphates. But then I had the opportunity of my life to come back again to the United States and, yeah. and work in the, in the lab of Bob Murphy, which is a legend in mass spectrometry of lipids and in a cosanoid studies, he elucidated the structure of what then was called SRSA, which turned out to be systemy leukotrienes. And to learn mass spectrometry, to, to that date, I had used many other techniques, but not mass spectrometry. And, and that really changed my career and the focus of my career. And we spent many years also studying another group of very interesting enzymes, the other side of the land cycle which is the lysophospholipidase transferases. And, mm. and we did some very, very nice studies with those in, in part in collaboration with Dennis Volker, who's another extraordinary biochemist in Denver. So I've been very blessed to work with very talented people and to bump into very interesting enzymes. Yeah, there are a lot of very, very challenging and very interesting enzymes. And I think much as we know quite a lot about regulation of lipid metabolism now, there's still an awful lot yet to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Because there so are many, it's... many more there. But it's really encouraging to go to meetings and to read the literature and see that how much progress is being made in the recent years, in part thanks to the accessibility of mass spectrometers that even people like me can use. And... <laughs> <laughs> well, Miguel, it's been a fascinating chat. Thank you very much for your time. Maybe we'll have you back on another Lipid Maps podcast in the future. That would be my pleasure. And, and I can't thank enough Lipid Maps and its sponsors and especially the Wellcome Foundation because it, it's a critical tool. I mentioned mass spectrometers, but Lipid Maps itself as a website, as a source of information, I think is a key player in the advancement of lipid biochemistry. So thank you guys for all you do. Mm -hmm.